What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and it's Tuesday, which means it's time to talk through my must-add waiver wire targets for week six of the fantasy football season. Today, we're going to talk through 10 to 15 players all under 50% owned in ESPN leagues. First, starting off with my priority ads. These are guys I'm using waiver wire priority on or big fab bids of, you know, 15% plus. And first up, that'll be Tank Bigsby. Now, I wouldn't go crazy, right? I'm not going to use like my first waiver wire priority on Tank Bigsby. He's not like a clear smash start handcuff type of ad, but he is still really good. Now, if you want access to how much fab I'm bidding on every single player, that'll be on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. Every single Tuesday, I post this video and then I go and I write an article going through every single waiver wire ad, how much fab I'm bidding on them. And at the end, I have a drop list as well, because I know a lot of you guys ask me, hey, Ron, I have this player. Should I drop him? That is all answered there. Patreon.com slash Ron Stewart in the description and the comment section down below. Now, with Tank Bigsby, again, nothing crazy, but he has been, like, to be honest, the most efficient running back in the NFL through five weeks. He outsnapped Travis Etienne yesterday, or no, two days ago at this point, 23 to 22. He did run less routes than Etienne, though, but he is just having an amazing season. He is first, ru- first in rushing yards over expectation per attempt, third in PFF grade, 50% success rate, first in yards per carry. ETN not playing terribly, but just nowhere near as efficient as Bigsby right now. Now, I don't think it's going to be a full-on takeover. Like, Bigsby's not going to just be the lead running back from here on out. But we have Travis ETN dealing with a shoulder injury right now, which is, you know, some uncertainty. Maybe that gives Bigsby an out to being a starter in this next week. And then also... If ETN misses time, of course, Bigsby is like a top 12 option. Kind of just comes down to ETN's health. But with ETN healthy, to me, he's more like a fringe RB3, like desperation start. But clearly, tons of upside as a handcuff. He had 13 carries, 101 yards, two touchdowns, and a catch for 28 yards. Just every time he touches the ball, um, explosive plays happen. Uh, And similar story with Tyrone Tracy, right? He comes in here in his first start. Shout out to Jacob Gibbs. 18 rushes, 129 yards. They all gained positive yardage. 62% 62% snap rate, 82% running back rush share this past week without Devin Singletary. Now, I think that we're going to have Tyrone Tracy see a real role here where he gets 6 to 10 touches in a given week. Devin Singletary, though, is probably still the lead guy. He has a lot of history with Brian Dable dating back to Buffalo. And Singletary's been just fine this year. Um, and Tyrone Tracy... He's great, he's explosive, but he's not the same, you know, short yardage back that Devin Singletary is in terms of their skill set. So I think Tyrone Tracy is going to hurt Devin Singletary's ceiling. I think Tyrone Tracy is working his way in to this running back rotation, but I would be hesitant to say that like Tyrone Tracy is going to run away with this job, at least in the near future. I would imagine Singletary comes back, but Singletary did miss this game with a groin injury. If he misses week six, we're talking about uh, Tyrone Tracy as a top 24 start yet again. Uh, Then our third player here, Ty Chandler, rostered in about 35% of leagues here. Uh, And it's pretty simple. Aaron Jones went down with a like groin hamstring injury. This is an excerpt from 444's injury article they do with Jeff Mueller. And pretty much they have a bye week this week, which is why this is lower down the priority list because Aaron Jones can get healthy and then come back right away in week seven. But if that doesn't happen, we would have Ty Chandler as the bell cow in week seven and would be a high end RB2 option. According to Dwayne McFarland here after Aaron Jones left, he saw 83% of the snaps, 79% of the rush attempts, 56% of the routes, 11% of the targets. That is all really, really, really good stuff. Again, he would be a must start if Aaron Jones missed time, but it's tough to like do the calculus of how big of a bid should I put on Ty Chandler knowing you can't play him in week six. And then it's a toss up truly. If you can play him in week seven, depending on Aaron Jones's health, Uh, our next must add is going to be Alexander Madison. Now these next three players are must adds and priority bids, but you should have like in competitive leagues, these guys should be already rostered, but Madison rostered in about 40% of ESPN leagues at this point. And we already knew Zamir White wasn't playing this week, so Alexander Matter comes out here, or Alexander Madison comes out here, gives you 75% of the rushing attempts, 8.3% of the targets. He gets 18 opportunities, but it was against a good Broncos defense, so he didn't really produce on that volume, but he got volume. That will likely stay with him, especially with Zamir White potentially out another week or so 
for this Raiders team. Then we have Trey Sermon, who again was like our top ad last week, somehow only rostered 50% of ESPN leagues. I don't know how that works, but he was the RB2 in expected points this week. That is just your volume, your targets, your carries, your red zone opportunities. According to Hayden Winks, he was the RB2 in expected points this week. He had 16 opportunities. He scored a touchdown. He caught passes. Trey Sermon, any game that Jonathan Taylor misses is a RB2, and Jonathan Taylor is looking like he'll miss another week or so. So Trey Sermon, somebody you can start uh, literally this week. Uh, and then our last guy in terms of priority bids is, again, another guy who should be rostered, but it's Braylon Allen. He's looked really good. Of course, the Jets have a ton of dysfunction right now. I will say this video would have been out an hour or two earlier, but the Robert Sala firing sent me into a little bit of a tailwind or a tailspin this morning. Uh, was posting on Twitter, talking with some friends. Uh, interesting time to be a Jets fan right now. I don't really have any other thoughts of, I don't think it really affects the offense at all, right? We're still going to have Nathaniel Hackett calling plays, but Braylon Allen, when he's had the ball, looks really good. And if Brees Hall was to ever go down, Braylon Allen, similar to Tank Bigsby, would be a must start. Now, that does it for our priority ads here. This is just going to be, now I'm going to list out some running backs, some wide receivers, some tight ends, and so on that you should be picking up. Antonio Gibson being one of them. This is from a Football Guys article uh, written by Adam Hutchinson. Ramondre Stevenson had a knee injury in this most recent game after being, you know, demoted from starter. But it was like, it was a fake demotion, right? He like just didn't play for the first drive and then was the starter the rest of the way. But if Ramondre has a knee injury, Antonio Gibson becomes a, you know, top 24, top 30 option. And he is coming off a game where he had a season high 47% snap share. But again, that was really just because of Ramondre's, you know, demotion or whatever, or him getting punished for the fumbles. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, then I'll throw out uh, Roshan Johnson. He is only rostered 11.2% of leagues right now. This is condensed down to a two-man backfield, uh, as said by Ryan Heath here. Over the last two games, Khalil Herbert has not taken any snaps. You have a 68.5% carry share for Swift and 100% of the backfield targets, but they have split the inside the five carries four to three in favor of Swift. So, Roshan's getting about a third of the work, and he's getting about half of the goal line opportunities. If things were to ever switch, and DeAndre Swift was to play like he was in weeks one through three, and Roshan became the starting running back here, that would be very, very interesting for fantasy football, and that's why I'm stashing Roshan anywhere I can. Um, then we have Blake Corum. I know a lot of people were, drop, were dropping Blake Corum. He's probably sitting out there on the waiver wire in a lot of your leagues. Go scoop him up. The Rams are on by. Blake Corum... You have to understand he is simply just a stash right now. You are never playing him. He is simply a stash handcuff that if Kyron Williams was to ever go down, you then play Blake Corum in that scenario, which is why we were even drafting Blake Corum like the ninth, 10th round of fantasy leagues. Again, dropping him in the first place to me was always a dumb thing. Uh, and in week five, he finally surpassed Ronnie Rivers. Ronnie Rivers took no offensive snaps here. Blake Corum got 14% of the snaps. 18% of the rush attempts. Nothing crazy, right? He had five carries for 25 yards. He had a catch for eight yards. He had two carries inside of the 10, but couldn't convert. And then uh, Kyron comes in and converts that into a touchdown. So I don't think we're going to see any crazy role for Blake Corum. But the fact that he went from like almost like a red shirt year, right? Where he had 15% of the snaps in week two and then nothing weeks three and four. Clearly behind Ronnie Rivers. The fact that he's now the clear two, that is huge. That now we know if Kyron goes down, Corum is the next man up. Uh, then we have Kamani Vidal. This is one that's underrated. I don't think a lot of channels out there are going to be talking about Kamani Vidal, but he's coming off of bye, and Gus Edwards, to this point, has been one of the worst running backs in the NFL in terms of expected points added per attempt. So this is just the rate that you are getting successful carries, the rate that you are getting first downs, touchdowns, you know, big chunk plays, just helping your team in general. When Gus Edwards carries the ball, he is one of the worst in the league at helping his team win football games, low success rate. He has been awful. It wouldn't be shocking. After a bye week, we get a post-bye rookie bump, and we get that for Kamani Vidal here. He was a really fun prospect coming out, someone that people had a lot of high hopes for, and I think we could start to see him work back in. He could be a guy where Gus Edwards is like a healthy scratch this week, and Kamani Vidal gets like a 30% snap share, and is at the top of the list as the number one or number you know two, three, four ad going into week seven next week. So you might as well be ahead of the waiver wire and grab him now. Um, let's talk about wide receivers. Now, I didn't mention any wide receivers in like the top end priority bids because unless if it's like a Puka Nakua situation or a uh, Dontavion Wick situation like last week, I'm not going all out on receivers off of waivers because usually it is a, you know, 
pretty dire situation. A lot of these guys you don't pick up and they just become instant mega producers. But with Jalen Talbert, he is a year three guy. So you can take the year three breakout stuff a little bit seriously here. He had 10 targets, seven catches, 87 yards, and a touchdown versus the Steelers this week. He's the wide receiver 31 at 11.3 points per game. That's better than Chris Olave and Amari Cooper. He's the third option in a Dak Prescott offense, you know, of course, after CD and Ferguson. I think that's a fine player. You know, it's not really a guy I'm, I'm dying to start in like your normal 12-man two wide receiver, two flex league. But I know that bye weeks are coming up. People are down bad. And Jalen Tolbert is probably a fine flex play moving forward. Um, and then let's talk about the Colts wide receivers. Let's just talk about all of them here. And in terms of like my preference for them, it'll it's Downs, then Pierce, then Mitchell. But I think it's close. Like I would, Mitchell I'd prefer as a stash, but if I needed instant production, I would go Alec Pierce. Um, and Flacco is just great news for these wide receivers, right? The Colts passing offense weeks four through five. Fourth in EPA per drop back, which is just your passing efficiency, passing yards per game way up, pass rate over expectation way up, and then from weeks one to three, all of that was way down. Now, I still am a believer in A-Rich. I think he's going to play as soon as this week, but for any game that A-Rich misses, all these pass catchers get a huge bump as shown here by Ryan Heath. Uh, Downs is a 27.4% target share, uh, 14.4 points per game since returning. Pittman, 23% target share, 13.2 points per game. A.D. Mitchell, 11.6% of the targets, 3.4 points per game. Alec Pierce, 7.4% of the targets, but 9.9 points per game. And this is like roughly games with Joe Flacco at this point. So Josh Downs and Pittman are top 24 wide receivers at any game that Flacco plays in, while Alec Pierce is like a boom-bust flex play as well. Uh, you can even see here, like Alec Pierce is literally the wide receiver 22 on the season, which is really crazy. It's tough to trust the volume that he gets on a week-to-week -week basis, but in terms of just like fringe guys to pick up and throw in your flex spot, very few guys offer the same downfield upside as Alec Pierce. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, A.D. Mitchell here, I will leave him up for the rookie receiver report, but the reason we like him so much, right, and I'll kind of show, yeah, so he's all the way down here. He's under Cade Stover. Um, you can see his route shares are hovering around like 27%, 24%. So he's not startable, but 30.3% targets per out run is only behind Malik Neighbors and only behind Troy Franklin. He is getting out there. He's commanding targets, which is good. He just hasn't been efficient on those targets yet, but this could be a situation where, you know, maybe Alec Pierce goes down or Pittman goes down. A.D. Mitchell runs more routes. He finds some consistency. And if he can just couple some production with his really good ability at getting open and earning targets, we are really, really playing with some fire down the stretch. And the whole reason that we like rookie receivers is because as the season goes on, according to Jack Miller and you know some research he did back in the day, as the season goes on, rookie wide receivers get better, veterans get worse. And that's why we like a guy like Jalen Polk here um, as another ad this week. He's someone you can kind of just stash, but he also has the same upside case as a rookie receiver. He could get Drake May, which would be a huge, huge boost to this passing game. And Jalen Polk here, right under AD Mitchell, ran a season high, 97% of the routes. He had a big play called back for San Francisco. He had a touchdown called back for Miami this week. He's showing life with a 15% target per out run. He had like seven targets this week. He's finding his footing. We just need better offense and quarterback play in New England, which could be coming with Drake May. Uh, we've seen, you know, Jaden Daniels completely turn around Washington. But of course, there is a, the possibility that Drake May comes in and he sucks. But I'm willing to find out what that looks like when that happens. And it seems like it's going to happen relatively soon. Uh, now let's talk about a tight end here. If you need to pick up a tight end, right, if everybody is picked up and you're struggling at the tight end position, I like Tyler Conklin. He's on a little bit of a tear here. He's the tight end nine over the last three weeks. And according to Ryan Heath, uh, you can add Jake Ferguson to this list. Him and Jake Ferguson are the only tight ends with six or more targets in each of the last three weeks. Tyler Conklin is like a genuine piece of this passing offense right now. And I would be fine just playing the hot hand with Conklin if I was that down bad. Then I'll give you a quarterback streamer as well. Danny Dimes, he's the QB 14 right now, which isn't bad at all. He's only rostered in 14% of leagues, and he gets the Bengals this week who are allowing the fifth most points to quarterbacks in fantasy football. And this is a really good tweet by Pat Thorman. The Bengals are averaging the most total points in the NFL. So that is the amount 
of points your defense gives up and the amount of points your offense scores. Bengals games are just insane right now. They're getting into shootouts with the Panthers. They're getting into shootouts with the Ravens. Every team versus the Bengals are ending up in shootouts, and that is what you're kind of hoping for with Daniel Jones here. And then I will add as well, we don't usually do defenses, but shout out to Subverted Down. I've shouted them out for as long as I've made content. I don't even know the guy who you know owns the website Subverted Down. Uh, but it does quarterback streamers, kicker streamers, defense streamers every single week. Here are your best def uh, defenses this week. I put a red stripe through any team that is over 50% owned in ESPN, but Texans are great, Chargers are great, Eagles are great, then a tier break to Bills, Colts, and Bears as your defenses for this week. Now, that's going to do it for us today. Again, if you want my waiver wire report and fab guide article, that will be out in the next couple of hours over on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. You can find that in the description or the comment section down below. But if you can't support there, just leave a like, subscribe, and I will see y'all in the next one. Stones, uh, like this froze, uh, ice cold, uh, oh, oh, uh, ice around my body like